Welcome to the Wired World of Esports, a show devoted to all things esports. I'm your host, Catherine Knorr. Today, we're talking about diversity in esports. Joining me are Joni Kraut, the CEO of Women in Games International, and GamerDoc, Dr. Lindsay Miglior. Dr. Miglior is the Advocacy Director of Women in Games International and the founder of Queer Women in Esports. Welcome, Dr. and Lindsay. Thanks for having us. I'm sorry. <laughs> I kind of, I said Dr. and Lindsay, I mean Dr. and Joni. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks for having us. I'm excited to be here. All right. Well, I think the first question, Joni, is what is um, Women in Games International? Yeah, absolutely. So Women in Games International is a global organization based in Los Angeles, California. And our mission is to cultivate resources to advance economic equality and diversity in the video games industry. So we are made up of male, female, non-binary professionals, and we promote diversity through um, development, publishing, media, education, and workplaces. So it's really based on this fundamental belief that um, increased equality and camaraderie among genders can make global impacts for superior products and consumer enjoyment and just an overall stronger gaming industry. Doctor, have you found that there aren't as many women in esports? I mean, the, in any sort of STEM field like esports, like gaming, like medicine, uh, you know, there tends to be a dominant voice that is traditionally white and traditionally male. Uh, you know, esports was a was no new field for me to come into. It just felt like going into medicine again. So yeah, it's 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 a huge issue um, because not only is that exclusionary, but a lot of really good data out there shows that when you do become more equitable when you do become more diverse as a company, you do become more profitable. And that's why I love Wiggy so much is because it's like, hey, everyone include women. It's a great idea. You should do it to be good, but it's also like, and also it's a good business decision. So yes, I've found that. Sure. And you know, one thing that I've noticed is um, I've had this show since July and most of my guests have been men. And I've tried really hard to find women guests and it's been a little difficult. And it's interesting because in one of the um, uh, trade association, um, it, what is that called? The Esports Trade Association, mm -hmm. uh, one of the get togethers, uh, I think it was either a webinar or a happy hour. I, I saw Joni there, I met, met Joni there. And it was interesting because I noticed her because she's a woman mm -hmm. and I was actually communicating with the women there because I really wanted to get some women on. So I'm really appreciative that we have a, a crew of all women today. Um, so Joni, what is, um, why was we formed and when was it formed? Oh, um, so we were formed in 2005. Uh, it was uh, an add on to a conference and it was really to promote women who were making an impact in the industry at the time. Um, there wasn't really a lot of recognition for women in the games industry at that time. So um, a, a group kind of formed this idea of having this add on to, to really give them that space and that recognition that they deserved. Uh, we moved on from just this add-on conference to actually being a networking event with uh, GDC and E3. Those are kind of our two biggest uh, parties that we're known for. And um, from there, we have been pivoting and we are working on living in this new virtual space and this, this new world that COVID has created for us. And we're finding that silver lining of being able to really reach a global community and um, just kind of continue to build and grow. Sure. And... Uh, why don't you, um, uh, Doctor, what is your role in the organization? So I'm the, I was brought on recently as the director of advocacy. And basically my role is, um, you know, Wiggy has all these amazing resources and these amazing programs that we have and that we're going to be launching in the new year. Um, and if you give people opportunities and you give people resources, what is affecting their ability to take advantage of those resources, right? Um, so I am very prominently out as a queer woman. And when I, you know, when I experience a space, when I experience a conference, when I experience a workplace, I'm not just experiencing that as a woman, right? I'm experiencing that as a, as a queer woman, right? I cannot 
extrapolate my queerness from my femininity. Those two things do not exist separately. So similarly, if there's a BIPOC woman with a disability who's an engineer, she doesn't go to work as just a woman or just a black woman or just a woman with a disability, right? All of those things are coming together. Um, and so the, really the goal is, is when people are given resources and opportunities, you have to make sure that everyone can take care of them the same way. Everyone has the same opportunities and advantages to take, to take those resources. And equity doesn't trickle down, right? It doesn't trickle down from the top to the bottom. We know that. We know that from the first wave of feminism. We know that from history is that you have to advocate for specific populations because if you just advocate for women as a whole, it's going to universally benefit white, cisgendered, Christian, able-bodied, middle and upper, upper class women. So my job at Wiggy is really using our voice and using our platform to not just advocate for women, to advocate for all of those other populations that are also women, that are also needing a little bit of resources and advantage and making sure that our equity doesn't trickle down. It is a conscious decision to help all women and not just those specifically put in a position to take advantage of our resources. Terrific. So you're a, a very important voice in the organization. So well, uh, the important yeah. voice. I'm just the <laughs> other person. Joni's the important voice. So Joni, tell me what your role is in the organization. Uh, so I took over as CEO in October. I had originally started with Wiggy as CFO. Um, I've been here about a year and a half now. So um, we really used 2020 to kind of take a step back and figure out what we wanted to do. What was our real strategy? Um, Wiggy has been successfully building a global community of women, allies, and underrepresented gaming industry professionals for over 15 years. So we had previously been pretty focused on creating impact through in-person networking events where we could create and foster a safe, fun space for people any point in their gaming careers. And so when I took over, one of my biggest pivots was to really figure out how do we identify what we want to be doing? Where do we want to be in one year, three years, five years? What are our intentions and how can we align our efforts and our strategy to meet those goals? So um, we've really been using 2020 to rebuild with sustainable growth mindset. We've added to our team, we built out our board of directors, we've redefined our program models, and we recently announced an updated logo and changed our branding. Um, and really just redefining what it is when you say in the gaming industry, what, what are you including with the gaming industry? So, and that's kind of how we pivoted into esports and um, tabletop gaming as well. Okay. So earlier um, you mentioned that uh, there are men in the organization. Doctor, what are the men's roles in the organization? It's basically like a you know, a club you would join in high school that, you know, your goal, you're like the green planet club, or you're like the recycling club, right? Everyone's goal is the same. It doesn't matter if you're, you know, who you are, what your role is in the company. Everyone is contributing to the goal. Everyone thinks that recycling is a good idea because we want to save the planet. We all believe in climate change. We want to, you know, make this planet a better future. You have this a better future for the planet than can be. Um, so it doesn't matter what you identify as, right? We all believe in the same goals. We all believe in the same overall goals. So, you know, men in the organization, their roles the same as, as women. Um, it's, it's just to make gaming a more equitable place for everyone because it's a good idea. Um, so it, yeah, it doesn't matter what your identifiers are. Everyone's roles are the same. Sure. So how has it been, Joni, uh, in 2000 and and 20 with the with COVID, um, how have you operated and, and uh, survived and thrived during this challenging year? That's a great question. Uh, we really used 2020 to to take a step back. And uh, previously, we'd been very focused on in-person networking events, and obviously, we couldn't do that. So, um, how did we how do we pivot into into like a, a virtual space or um, in a way that we can still reach our amazing community that we've been building. And uh, we've, we've used this year to really find new ways to restructure. Uh, so we are launching short-term programs, long-term programs. We have new workshops. Uh, we're la launching a monthly partnership program, which Lindsay is heading and defining, and it's very exciting. 
Um, we're identifying new ways to engage with our community. And uh, one thing that I'm very excited about is we are launching a scholarship program to get people who otherwise couldn't afford to get to gaming conferences. We want to get them there. We want to get them in the door. Um, we're also partnering with um, Dress for Success to have different meetings to help get them to a place where they're comfortable to be at the conference and just make sure that they are representing their best truest self. So I would say 2020, we've really been working in stealth mode to just build and uh, restructure and, and figure out how to move forward in the best way, as you said, to uh, not just survive, but to really thrive in 2021 and beyond. Sure. And doctor, tell us about the partnership program. Yeah, so we had discussed earlier, you know, it, it's it's about advocating for other groups, um, other groups that women are a part of. So what we're going to be doing is every month we're going to be highlighting a different nonprofit or company that their views really align with us. So a good example is Take This, right? Take This is a gaming nonprofit that focuses on positive mental health in the space. Um, you know, lots of women there are lots of women who exist who struggle with mental health. Um, you know, mental health is a big issue in esports and gaming. And so by advocating for Take This, we're advocating for different subgroups of our population. Uh, so we're going to be using our platform to share their mission, share their voice. Um, we're going to be hosting them on our monthly streams and discussing their mission, uh, discussing how, you know, together we can make gaming a better place for everybody and then we will also be using our social media platforms to champion their ideas. Sure and Joni um, any additional plans for 2021 um, besides those you mentioned? World takeover. Yeah world takeover absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we have a lot of really exciting things that we're going to announce um, and we're rolling everything out in January. We're doing kind of a, a new year, new wiggy kind of promotion in January to really highlight all the work that we have been putting together behind the scenes. Um, just creating those, those new initiatives and, and making sure that everyone is aware of these resources that we've been cultivating and, and putting together. How did, um, Joni, how did um, Wiggy get into eSports? We, in rebuilding and restructuring, we had a lot of really great conversations around impact and empowerment. And we started talking about how to enable women and underrepresented people in the games industry, um, how to improve industry diversity, how to encourage and promote inclusion efforts. And we dug down deep and got to the point where we even we're asking how do we define the games industry and one of my biggest first pivots as CEO was to really broaden that that games industry perspective. Um, I've always been a big fan of esports uh, for over 10 years and D&D and, &D and tabletop gaming and so it just seemed natural to incorporate kind of all gaming and in that definition and Speaking with women in the industry, in the esports industry right now, there's a definite need for support and equality conversations to take place. Um, we really just want diversity across the board and across every aspect of the games industry, from video games to board games to esports. You name it, we want to be there. We want to be encouraging and supporting people. So, Doctor, how many women are actually involved in esports and gaming? That's a really good question. Uh, you know, esports has a problem, right? 50% um, of people who identify as gamers identify as female. 30% of esports viewers identify as female. But if you look at the overall esports earners for 2019, uh, in the top 500, there's one woman. Um, I think Scarlett was at like 320. And then you look at the overall esports earners for 2020. And there is not one person who identifies as female in the top 500. Um, and you know, you know this. We all know this. Esports isn't just about the competitors. It's not just about the athletes. It's about the people in front of the camera, the people behind the camera, the people making the decisions about the orgs, the org leaders, you know, the org C-suite. And there is a shocking lack of women involved in that space. Uh, you know, there there is a huge issue in esports of representation of equity um, and of, of opportunity. So yeah, esports has a <laughs> has an incredible need for, uh, you know, 
diversity, basically, at the end of the day. Sure. And so women, to me, have to the total capability to be as good as any man in esports. Is that right? Better. <laughs> Better? <laughs> Better. Yes, that's the party line. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's so interesting because you talk about esports, you talk about gaming, you talk to people who might not know how gaming works, who might not know how esports works, and you tell them, okay, you're playing a video game for money. And that, that first of all, that blows their mind, right? No one blows their mind. They're like, so you're telling me I'm playing Miss Pac-Man for money. So, so that's the first barrier you have to get over. Um, and then you talk about, you know, the, the, the diversity, the representation issue in gaming. And, and that blows people's minds because they're like, how does testosterone have any advantage in the gaming scene, right? How does, why are there, why is there an issue, right? Like, because it's open. A lot of the, the, the tournament formats are open. You, you, you're in the fighting game community. You go to a gaming event, you, you, submit your, you submit your name, you get paired up with an opponent. If you beat them, you move on to the next round. If you beat them, you move on to the next round. If you beat them, you move on to the next round and you win the tournament. Last year, the Fortnite World Cup gave out like $20 million, $30 million in prizes. And it was completely open. If you wanted to qualify, all you had to do was place above a certain amount every single time in the qualifiers. So, so why is there an issue, right? If women were good enough, they'd just be good enough, right? They'd be in those final competitions. But the question then arises, how do you get good, right? You just don't read Ninja's book, but you have to train against the best in the field for a long period of time. How do you get involved in that? Well, before, you know, the Fortnite matchmaking system, you had to be in a Discord server. You have to be in a Discord server and you had to be invited and you had to be able to tolerate and read those Discord channels. Every person with a high-pitched voice and, you know, not high-pitched, but pitched above medium-ranged voice knows what it's like to go into a Discord server or to go into a matchmaking lobby with your voice comms on, Right immediately immediately you're gonna hear are you a girl why aren't you in the, why aren't you in the kitchen or you're gonna hear worse things than that right it mm -hmm. happens to me every single time i play every single time i try and play with friends or people who aren't friends that happens and for people who are 15 16 years old who have just discovered multiplayer gaming puberty is hard enough already to inject that type of toxicity into your life is unbearable it's unbearable and people they stop using voice comms what happens when you stop using voice comms in gaming you no longer can play competitively right you cannot compete in esports without using voice comms teamwork is a huge part of it and so women and people who have voices who don't sound like certain people or people who you know have a certain tolerance for words that are being said get pushed away from online gaming at a very early age they're not competing against the people who are the best therefore they're not getting as good as they can get therefore they are not competing in the competitions and winning the competitions like they could be um so so that is really a huge barrier the first barrier that has to be broken down in esports is stopping toxicity when it starts right mm -hmm. 14 15 16 year olds shouldn't you know their twitch released a banned words today you can't say simp, you can't say incel, and you can't say virgin, right? And people freaked mm. out. People freaked out about that. But it's like, of course you can't. You shouldn't be saying those words. You shouldn't be regurgitating the slang that Tifu and Mongrel and everyone are saying. Um, the, the, the culture of toxicity in esports has to change, and it is changing, and that people who don't change with it will be left behind. And it's so known that this is the problem, you know, like when I started doing research on esports, it was very, it was mentioned everywhere that uh, there was discrimination within mm -hmm. esports. So it didn't surprise me when I found out about your organization, Joni. Um, so Joni, do you have any thoughts about that? I think we just need more big names to support diversity and inclusion and, and show that it's important having uh, a statement that truly uh, stops harassment and and 
having those those words and kind of that extra layer of of showing that you if you're silent you're supporting it if you're if you're not speaking against it if you're not calling out the tech the toxicity and the harassment you might as well be doing it yourself so i would say finding big name companies and and top gamers or performers who are going to speak against it and have you know those specific pushes to to promote inclusion and diversity within the industry is is one of the bigger things that we've seen make the most impact in having it stop and and making that change the esports is so young it's such a young and growing industry there's so much opportunity for i mean esports fans just love esports because it's an online gaming community that allows you to to participate regardless of your your gender or what you look like or you know disabilities and and that's really what we want to promote is is allowing people to be within that safe space and and just have fun and be themselves so doctor what makes esports barriers different than gaming barriers it's once you inject that that competition uh, things things become really different. So there, a really interesting paper came out earlier this year, and it looked at collegiate esports programs. It looked at the diversity in those esports programs, and then it looked at the level of funding they received. And the higher the funding, the higher the amount of institutional involvement. Right, once it stopped being a student-run club that they had to fundraise for their own money, and once it became more of a you know, coach advisor with their fell under the athletics program or they fell under the extracurricular program. Um, as soon as the institution and money started getting involved, it started getting less and less and less and less diverse. Um, the, the, the student led programs tended to be pretty diverse, more diverse than most esports programs are. And then the institutional ones tended to be the traditional esports. Um, demographic. So, so once you inject um, any amount of competition, any amount of, of money into something, people inherently are like, okay, let's, I want to win. I want to make some money. I want to get more sponsors. Um, and the easiest way to do that is to follow the traditional mold, right? The easiest way to do that is to say, I'm going to do what everyone else is doing. I'm not going to think for myself. Um, I'm not going to advocate for other people. And then that's it, you know, because because the thing is, is that esports programs, if they want to win, right, they want their program to succeed, they're going to recruit from the people who are the best at the video game. They're not doing any outreach, they're not doing any training, they're not doing any sort of, and where are they recruiting, right? Where are they recruiting their players from? Um, these are all factors that take into account the demographic, the makeup of these well-funded esports programs. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that it's just, it's just such a, a struggle when esports, like any brand new industry or field, when it starts to become something, where do you get that field map? Where do you get that guide map from, that guidebook, that map from? How do you decide the next steps to take? And there isn't, there, there isn't a great book, right? There isn't a how-to guide on how to start a effective esports program. I mean, there's a couple, but uh so people tend to fall on the easiest path of least resistance. Um, but those aren't the people who get into esports, right? The actual game changers in esports, the actual ones who are making a difference are the ones blazing a trail, right? And so, you know, we have to, we have to just try a little bit, I think. <laughs> sure. And so what is performance allyship? Yeah, so performative allyship. So uh, that's a really good question. So why are you advocating for a group that doesn't look like you that you don't belong to right why are you saying hey you know black lives matter hey i'm going to celebrate for pride month hey it's hispanic heritage month i'm going to talk about this group um what are your motives behind that and for a lot of people you know for a lot of people it's genuine it's i want to i want to do better i understand my privilege um i want to help I want to understand the plight of other people. I want to contribute to this cause. But for a lot of people, especially when you get into the corporate sphere, it's because they want to look good and they want to mm. make themselves feel good. So, you know, Crest, oh my God, Crest. They, I think a couple, couple years ago for June for Pride Month, they turned all of their packaging rainbow. 
Mm. All of their packaging became rainbow for all of their toothpaste. Uh, why did they do that? I'm not sure. Um, they didn't give a lot of money back to the queer community. Uh, a really good example is that person in your family who, or your friend group who posts a picture of themselves at Pride, right? They're at the Pride mm. Parade. They've got their rainbow um, eye makeup on. They've got a flag around their back. Um, but then when they're at Thanksgiving, three months, five months later, their cousin says that they don't believe gay people should get married and they keep their mouth shut, right? They don't mm. confront their cousin right at that moment. They're not advocating in that moment. Um, and then your cousin goes to work and says that to his coworkers. And one of his coworkers is probably gay. Um, and that coworker is now feeling that statement and that pain. Um, if, if you don't confront your homophobic cousin, you don't get to post that picture at Pride Month, mm. right? That's performative. Mm. It's not doing anything. Okay. You got to put your money where your mouth is, right? Like if you sure. say you support something, you got to support it. So that's something that I get really passionate about. Oh, well, that's super interesting. So <laughs> now on a kind of a different topic, Joni, what do you play? What games do you play? Oh, um, I'm a huge fan of World of Warcraft. <laughs> That's oh, okay. My, my gateway game. Um, I know. I uh, I also like D and D, so definitely nerd. Um, my favorite uh, esports game is definitely uh, CS:GO, though. That's my. It's the one I can watch for hours and. Terrific. I'm not good at it, but yeah. It's kind of okay, and how about you, Doctor? Uh, I'm I'm the worst esports person. Like I love watching. Valorant. I love watching League of Legends. You know, I'm getting really into Rocket League. It's like tier two, tier three, but it has the capabilities to be tier one. Um, but at the end of the day, if you give me, if I have an afternoon off, I'm playing Fortnite. I am. And Fortnite's esports scene is in shambles. I mean, it's, it's never mm -hmm. going to be a tier one esport. Um, it's hard for any battle royale to become a tier one esport, but the way that the competitive scene is arranged with Fortnite, like I touched on earlier, it's open. Right? It's always open. Um, they have very few invite only tournaments anymore. And so as such, it's like if you were to turn on Monday Night Football and the Steelers were playing the Ravens, but Ben Roethlisberger got beat out by a quarterback from Wisconsin uh, whose name is Jonah Smith, right? And you're like, I don't know who that is. I have no idea who this kid is. I don't know anything about his background. Fortnite's competitive esports scene is always changing. The names are always changing because the meta is always changing, right? They they introduced yeah. um, they, they buffed aim assist in a recent a recent uh, patch. And if you don't know what aim assist is, it's you know if you're aiming with a mouse and a keyboard, you have a, an intrinsic advantage because it's easier to aim rather than moving two sticks around. So they added whenever you moved your controller towards a player's head, it would snap onto that person. So they buffed aim assist. So all of a sudden, all the people who were playing Fortnite competitively at a high level were controller players because aim assist was too strong. Um, and that was like a month. And then all of a sudden they took away aim assist, right? They nerfed it. And all of a sudden, all those controller players were gone and it was back to the PC players. Um, so every time they change the meta, different people pop into the scene. So esports. Um, Fortnite's esports scene is is not great, uh, and that's why when when you ask me what my favorite game is, and I'm I don't feel any shame, but some people might give me some smack, <laughs> you know, talk smack to me. <laughs> but I stand by my decision. Me and all that six year olds. Sounds good. All right. So anyway, um, uh, Joni, how can we find Wiki? Oh uh, yeah. If um, if anything today resonated with you, we would love to hear from you. Uh, we are at getwiggy.com. That's G-E-T-W-I-G-I.com. Um, subscribe to our newsletter. Uh, we send that out every week on Wednesday. And then uh, reach out to me directly, Joni at getwiggy.com. And I'd be happy to hear from you. Fantastic. Well, thank you both for being with me today. I learned a lot. Thank so, you so much for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. It was a pleasure. And don't contact me, contact Joni, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thank you, our viewers, for joining us today. My next show will be on January 6th when I talk with Jennifer Uchin of Augment Ed about esports and education. Wishing you happy holidays and looking forward to seeing you in the next year on the wide world of esports. See you then.